Welcome to The Mixtape with Scott, a podcast that provides an oral history of economics covering topics that span the last 50 years of the field. I focus on subjects that I like, though, things like Gary Becker's students or uh, causal inference to contemporary topics like economists in the tech industry. But it's also a platform I use to listen to the personal stories of real economists and scientists as they walk me through their lives from childhood to present, as well as walk me through the biographies of some of their own work. I'm your host, Scott Cunningham. This week, I had the immense pleasure of interviewing Stephen Barry, the David Swinson Professor of Economics at Yale and winner of the 1996 Frisch Medal for the Best Applied Article in Econometrica. He's a very distinguished economist who publishes at the crossing of econometrics and a field called industrial organization, which is a theory of firms and markets. We dived into his life growing up in the Midwest, his love of science fiction as a kid, and the amazing faculty he studied with at the University of Wisconsin, like Charles Mansky, Gary Chamberlain, Art Goldberger, John Rust, and if you can believe it, many more than that. It was a real Hall of Fame group and in what sounds like an amazing time to be a graduate student anywhere. He's the author also of a highly influential paper uh, popularly called BLP, which is short for Barry, Levinson, and Pecos. It's a 1995 article in Econometrica entitled Automobile Prices in Market Equilibrium. And it's had a massive effect in both industrial organization from a public policy point of view, as well as private policy point of view, given its widespread influence within industry. Uh, It's used for studying all kinds of questions that we sort of think of as uh, defined by deep endogeneity related to market equilibrium like demand elasticities. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. Also check out my Substack, Scott's Substack, where I semi-regularly post what I call explainers about econometrics. And now let me introduce you to Steve Barry. Thanks. Okay. Well, it is my pleasure to have on the podcast uh, a man I uh, admire a lot, um, Dr. Steve Barry. Steve, thanks so much for joining me today on the podcast. I am very happy to be here. Okay, before we get into your life, your whole life story, uh, could you, for the sake of the listener, uh, introduce yourself, tell us your name, your job title, and, and who your boss is? Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm Steve Barry. I'm, I'm sitting here at Yale in, in New Haven, Connecticut. I'm, I'm in the Department of Economics, and I do all the professor stuff. And actually, recently, I have a, a new different hat on, which is I'm uh, heading a brand new policy center at Yale called the Tobin Center. Oh, wow. The Tobin Center. The Tobin Center. Yes. Oh, yeah. I heard of that guy. Okay, yeah. That's cool. I can't wait to hear about that. What? All right. I'm going to add that to, to here. That'll go into one of the questions. Okay, great. great. You're heading it. That's what you said? Well, I'm the faculty oh. director. There's, there's, there's a full-time staff, so I should be a little careful about how much of the heavy lifting is done by me, but I'm the <laughs> faculty director. Oh, that's cool. Okay. All right. I'm going to, all right. We're going to follow up by that. We'll put a little yeah. plug in for the new center. All right. So, so, all right, so we, I wanted to start off with an icebreaker. If you could have a conversation with any historical figure, who would it be and why? Oh, geez, man, I hate these icebreakers. I always, I, always, I, I always feel like I'm going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're going to have the wrong conversation with I'm going to like a big figure. dull guy, and I'm going to say, oh, my God, why did I pick that guy? Okay, so the probably you got to go across so many different fields, right? So, yeah. so okay, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna restrict myself to economics. It's just 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 to make just to make uh just to make life simpler. Okay. Um. Okay, and maybe it's because I was just thinking about it for for our thing today. But I would love to go back uh, the same way. I would love to have a podcast about the life and where did your where did your ideas come from with P. G. Wright, who who who, who did oh, yeah. Like yeah. Oh, like so a, you I really would like to have him on my if I had a podcast in 1930. 19, 19, like I, I want to have <laughs> you're to talk to Philip Wright. Yeah, you're like, you're like dude, what's your more proud of? Appendix how did you, how did D you or publishing yeah. Carl Sandburg's poems? That's yeah. uh, that's great. Yeah, he's I actually, yeah, I want to talk about that. So he, he's he's yes. somebody that that makes a lot of sense. Okay, all right. So tell me, tell me where you grew up and what your childhood was like. Yeah, so I grew up all over the place. Um, um, um. Uh, my 
uh, father was a med student when I was born. So mm -hmm. I can truthfully say that I was born into the housing projects of Chicago near, near the Northwestern Med School. No, oh, okay. Med School. So that's, that's not, you know, if you, if you just mentioned the housing project stuff, it sounds like one thing. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. And he was drafted. We moved around, mm -hmm. uh, kind of different places in the, in the Midwest. He died. Uh, oh. we ended up outside of Cleveland, uh, and then I, uh, I was an undergraduate at, at Northwestern. So I, you know, I'm more or less a Midwesterner, but, right. but different places. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, you said he passed away when you were young? when I was 11. Yeah. Oh gosh. That must've been hard. Actually. Yeah, it was. It's funny at the time I, I told myself it wasn't and then later looking back, I thought, no, wait, you were wrong. It, no, it was unexpected. Was it was sort yeah. of, a, oh yeah. gosh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Well, so as a kid, um, were there any subjects or hobbies that you were kind of passionate about? I was a complete bookworm. I mean, I, I I did play hockey for a while and stuff, but really I was just a classic old fashioned bookworm. You know, mm. I, I don't think we had this word like nerd or something back there. So you were a bookworm, you know? Right, you know, right, right, right. You had heavy, thick glasses and you, you <laughs> had all your head buried in a book all the time. Yeah. My family would tease me. They'd say at breakfast, you're reading the back of the cereal box. <laughs> Well, what kind of books did you like to read? What would I have found on your bookshelf? Yeah, so when I was younger, I really liked, uh, I really liked, um, you know, kind of classic old fashioned science fiction. Oh, uh, was one of the things I liked. Uh, you, you know, uh, a bunch of people say they read, they read Asimov's Foundation trilogy uh, yeah. when they were young, and it's kind of social science fiction. Right. And I, think there are, I think Krugman has talked about this. Yeah. I, I know Professor Chicago has talked about this. Kind of looking back at it, uh, uh, wow, how much did, did, did that have some effect? The, right. the, the, the idea of kind of like social science sort of quantitative people who could, like, you oh. know, not control the world, but have, make some prediction about it. Oh, wow. Wait, so how uh, old were you and you read that? I must have been like 12 or something. Yeah, oh, and like, you really got into it. So you were reading yeah. all the science fiction stuff. Yeah, so I, I read a lot of science fiction, a lot of uh, a lot of historical fiction, just pulling stuff off the shelves of the school library. Kind of. Ah, huh. Yeah. What'd your teachers think about you in high school, in like grade school and high school? Uh, I think I was really nothing special until maybe a teacher found me in fourth grade. I, mm. I had an African-American teacher. We, we were actually living in Southern Ohio, kind of in Appalachia. Mm. And she noticed I liked to read. And she uh, sent me a bunch of books that had uh, African-American characters because there were no African-Americans in the school and there right. were no African-American books on the shelves. And she said, well, you're a reader and, uh, and uh, that's a great thing to be. And can you start reading these books? And somehow I think I, I kind of like, oh, I guess that is, you know, it's, it's not just something I do. It's kind of interesting to other people too. Right. Uh, so I think after that, I felt like I was a little more recognized as, as a good student. Huh. Um, huh. So you were drawn to the fiction, but not the math. You're, I guess you're going to tell me math at some point. Not, no, no. I would have said, uh, I was much stronger in um, in like writing and English and stuff. I was fine at math in high school. I mean, yeah. you know, I did a sequence. I was fine. Right. Um, um, uh, in college, I took what I, okay, I did not have very good advising, it turns out. I took what I thought was a fair amount of math, but turned out not to be a lot of math, mm. <laughs> mm. which I discovered once I hit graduate school. Mm. Um, um, yeah, so, so it was not originally math for me. Um, um, and indeed, I only got interested in calculus when I realized how connected it was to economics. Oh, so what's your first experience with economics? Is that high school? No, just, you know, and, and no, no, nothing in high school. Um, just enrolled, you know, standard introductory micro class. Um, and I was just thrilled. And suddenly yeah. it was like, oh, wait, I know what those derivatives were now. I know why someone would care. <laughs> Right, right. Care that much? It's like you know, here's the time that an object goes through space, and here's the connection to the physics. And uh, right, I, it never clicked particularly with me, actually. Right, right. So wait, it was you, the 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 math starts to come together in the econ classes as an undergrad. Yeah, but but in part, it wasn't even presented. I just I just oh. it suddenly occurred to me that there was a connection. Right, right. Um. Like, oh, wait, there's all this math behind the graphs. You could mm -hmm. like write it down, you could write down the equations. You could think about mm -hmm. where they came from. You could, yeah. 
uh, they're giving me slope. So right, 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 uh, right. That's the first time I really made that connection that there was like math behind this stuff, something that I was interested in, right. something that involved human behavior. Yeah. Um, as opposed to physical objects in space or something. Right. right. Wait, so is, what was it that what was it that was captivating you at the very, very beginning? Was it the social science part? I think it was. I, th I think it was. It was this idea that there's a set of analytic tools for looking at the world and thinking about, you know, why do things work? How would you make things better? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was just fascinated by it. Yeah. I maybe I do philosophy, but it's like this seemed better. Mm -hmm. So like if you hadn't majored in econ, it's like I that you might have ended up in the humanities. Yeah, I might have I might have done philosophy or something. Right, right, right. Because you were this you, you you as a kid had this like rich life of the mind. Yeah, exactly. And but it was like, oh look, all this stuff can be come together in this other way that's more for that you know that's clear that yeah. provides a structure for your thinking. Right. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting. Uh, uh huh. Okay. So did you have any role models or inspirations when you were in high school? Yeah, okay. So, so, you know, I, I, my, my father died. So um, I had a grandfather who in fact was a philosopher, which is probably one reason I was thinking about oh. He taught at a small liberal arts college in Ohio, Denison, which is outside of Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. He wrote a uh, philosophy textbook that was a, a, apparently a very well-selling philosophy textbook, which he joked with me when I started econ. He said, you know, I wrote the best-selling philosophy textbook, and Samuelson wrote the best-selling econ textbook, and he's rich, and I'm not because you don't know <laughs> many many philosophy textbooks. Also, top schools don't even use textbooks in philosophy; they just right, like, right, find right. Plato. They the books. Yeah, that's right. Right, exactly. So, being the text, it, it, it was geared more toward like not the top colleges, it right? Was places where you needed an introduction. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I thought he was a very sort of moral person yeah. who thought hard about like, what should a person do? What should, mm. what, what should the world be like? Mm. Uh, he, that's the way he wrote his textbook. It wasn't so much about the conundrums of epistemology or something. It was like philosophy is the study of who we are and how we came to be this way and, uh, how we think and what should we do? Right. Right. Yeah, uh, sure. And you saw us probably, I'm assuming, I mean, economics, uh, you, you could, you could see those questions even in econ probably. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. More than say in my continental philosophy class. So. Right. Right. So it wasn't just like econ wasn't just like a pure math thing. You could, no. you were sort of, you sort of saw it as. Yeah. Design. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like, like if you wanted to think about, you know, what should we do? Right. right? Uh, this, this was a, this was a framework that, that right. was just like, wow, that's amazing. Right, right, right. Well, so which professors do you remember in college in the econ department as like sort of having a big outsized impact on you, do you or their classes? Yeah, so that, okay, again, I, I somehow I managed not to get great advisors. I had a good time in college. My advisors were not that great. I didn't take any of the people at that time who would have been like the top research professors. I took uh -huh. the classes that were popular with the undergraduates that said they were great. Yeah. So there were things like urban economics and transportation economics. But again, they were super applied things like how do cities work? And, right. uh, uh, you know, what are the issues and what are the problems or mm. transportation economics or or um, uh, uh, public economics? Things where just there were just interesting policies to think about. Right, right, right. Uh, so that's kind of what I did. Yeah. Um, and and again, that it, it, it confirmed my idea that this was this was useful stuff. Right. 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 Yeah. So when, when did you decide that you wanted to become get a Ph.D. in economics? So. Right. So I, I, I decided I didn't want to go straight to graduate school. I wasn't sure. Try the work world a little bit. Uh, at the time, I had a girlfriend in Columbus, Ohio, which was also not that far from where I had some family. And I moved there and I worked for a family owned savings and loan. Uh, actually, one of the first issuers of adjustable rate mortgages in the country because they were an incredibly conservative family and would not issue 30 rate, 30 year fixed rate loans. Oh, interesting. <laughs> that seemed crazy to them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, wow. And I did that for a while. And I think confirming my view of who I was, they took me out of the general management training program and dumped me in their 
kind of analytic forecasting unit mm -hmm. uh, where there were a couple early Apple computers that we ran spreadsheet models on. Uh, and that kind of confirmed who I was, that I was more of an analytical person than a mm -hmm. business manager. And uh, my joke, although this isn't really the truth, is that there was the day when I was going to have to learn to play golf or or uh, or else apply to graduate school. So I applied to graduate school. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, man, that's funny. Uh, sure. Yeah. You, trade offs. Trade -offs, trade -offs incentives. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I learned this in school. Um, so, OK, so you get to Wisconsin. What year is yeah. that when you get to Wisconsin? What year is that? 1982. 1982. So, so who's there in 1982? Wait, real quick. Did you take any econometrics classes when you were at Northwestern? <coughs> yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Uh, no. Oh, Northwestern. Yes. Yes. Sorry. At Northwestern, yes. But again, maybe not the best advice. A slightly odd Bayesian undergraduate course where the guy kept telling us that he wasn't like the other classical econometricians, but I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> he kept contrasting himself to this other thing that I had never right. heard. Right. Yeah, you're right. So Northwestern, right. That, again, that's all I did. Uh, the the econometrics faculty at Wisconsin while I was there was unbelievable. It's oh, yeah? It's hard to imagine. So I took uh, first year econometrics from Art Goldberger. Oh, my gosh. Who you probably have seen his classic textbook. And, yeah. Uh, he was just a great teacher. He had these great lectures uh you know you learn the linear models so well and so deep um and just these great insights he would he would do readings aloud of people who said their r squared was reassuringly high and you know <laughs> why they were reassured he had his famous lecture um on micro numerosity which was actually just a satire on multicollinearity oh it was actually a chap. He actually had a whole paper on micro numerosity and what one should do to fix the problem of micro numerosity. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Trying to avoid that getting more data was the answer. <laughs> for micro numerosity. <laughs> Wait, did, he, did he teach your, what, your first year econometrics? First year econometrics, yeah. yeah. So you're, so when you go in, you only have that experience with that Bayesian guy from college. What was yeah. it, so what happens during that class? It was just... It, Again, at, at first, graduate school was very hard for me. I did not have the mathematical background. Presumably, it's one reason I was at Wisconsin instead of Harvard or something. I just didn't have the math prereqs, and they mm. would still let you in. Um, what they need back then? What was it back mm. then? What was sort of the standard line of the, the prereqs math that you needed back then? Yeah, so the thing that was stated on many schools, but, but not always, was linear algebra. Yeah. Um, now, people were starting to take... Um, 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 real analysis, which I finally did um, the year after my first year of graduate school. Mm. Um, um, but yeah, and there were a lot of people who had masters from the LSE. Oh, um, right. They take graduate courses as part of their undergraduate training. And I thought they were all geniuses because, you know, they would have a constrained optimization problem and they would just whip off the answer. And I was like, at first I was like, how did you know to do that? <laughs> Right. And then I figured out, well, that's just a really standard, almost algorithmic solution. And they learned right. it elsewhere. Right, right, right. They learned it elsewhere. <laughs> but I thought right, they were right. for a while. I'm like, you guys are geniuses. Just yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, wait, you had the floor. <laughs> so you, you, so during, during Dr. Goldberger's class, I mean, you, you sort yeah. of begin to grow. Something changes. Yeah. So again, I, I, I found out that I was okay at it. Right. I mean, that right. I could do that. And I taught myself linear algebra more or less on the fly and, mm. um, you know, got good grades. Um, 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 yeah. Didn't think of myself. I mean, by the way, I still don't think of myself as an econometrician by any, by any means. Um, oh, really? You, you don't, you don't identify with that, that name? No. Oh, no. interesting. No. Wow. Yeah, you're yeah. you're an you're an IO. I'm an IO guy. I'm a, yes. right. Yes, Yale has right. become much more applied over the years. I, yeah. I, I had an offer at a top business school, you know, maybe 20 years ago, and I said, "What would I teach?" And they said, "Well, econometrics, of course." And I said, right. "That's you turn, you turn you turn it down." Yale, I'm the data guy. <laughs> you're the apply. You're the data guy. <laughs> I'm the data guy. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> we have yeah. Don Andrews. I'm not teaching econometrics. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, IO is such a cool field because it's like the it's one of the applied fields that's just so has held on to the models so close. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get you back. Know? I mean, right, it's like exactly. so many 
so we learn all these models and then, you know, in a lot of applied work, it just comes down to really simple intuition, but in yeah. IO, it's just so deep. You just continue to work so closely with the theory. I bet yeah. that's been a lot of fun. I bet that's just, it's been a fun journey. It's a fun journey. So now think like in Goldberger's class, one of the set pieces of the course would be simultaneous equations theory, of course. Yeah. This is like, this is the, you know, an epitome for an economist of the linear model, you know, systems of linear uh, equation models in linear form, thinking about exclusion restrictions and yeah. excluded variables that were derived from that linear system, right? That, right. They had, they had, that the instruments are there in the system because you've fully specified the, the equation. So, I mean, yeah. that influenced me a lot. Um, and Y'all learned so that? Y'all learned that in that first year? Yep. First, yep. That first class? Oh. Yeah. 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 So that, that would be standard econometrics because... Uh, this is this is how you thought about endogeneity for sure. Right. You used instruments course. too, though, right? Within that, of course, because the equation. instruments come out of the simultaneous system, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're there. They're, they're in the other equation, determining. You know, there's an equation for for y two, the variable that is shows up later. You know, mm -hmm. in some other place on the right hand side of the y one equation. Mm -hmm. And so you could see which which variables are in the system that affect y two but don't affect y one. Right, and you right. Set up a big matrix, and 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 basically the exclusion restrictions and relevance are are necessary to invert the matrix that you're going right, to get right. to get the answer. Yeah, so instruments yeah. are there, often called an instrument, but 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 not always called an instrument in some yeah. sense. You know, it's it's basically a set of exclusion restrictions, and 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 you know, it's the right patterns of excluded and included variables to, uh, right. to learn about the coefficients that you want to learn about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's the way I learned that. And then you're you know, learning econometrics really at the, like, so closely wedded to market equilibrium. Yeah, that's right. So the two examples right. we got were supply and demand, which I yeah. carried forward, uh, systems of supply and demand. And when I did not carry forward so much, which were like, there's this classic thing that goes back to the Coles commission of motivating the simultaneous equations of a Keynesian model. Oh, really? Yeah, like the consumption equation. Oh, and, sure. Yeah, right. Right. There's like a, this set of, right. And was that identified? And, Wait, Goldberger's teaching you that, but you, th yeah. that's just kind of, that's more, that's a little more antiquated. In this yeah, I felt antiquated. Even yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's kind of macro a little bit. Yeah. And also it's macro, so I didn't care. Right. <laughs> 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 uh, and then, okay. So Chuck Mansky taught our second year. Oh, okay. So he would have been. He would have been like a pretty new faculty member. He was yeah. pretty young. He was pretty young. So Chuck Mansky taught our second year. Okay. He taught us a lot of discrete choice modeling. Um, he taught, he did basically taught us method of moments early. Mm. Um, uh, he was very into teaching econometrics. Um, I didn't quite realize it at the time, but realized it later, very much from the viewpoint of identification, that there's a model. How do you learn about it? What mm. are the restrictions? Of the model? How do you learn about the model? Um, so, you know, if he were to teach OLS, he wouldn't say it's a least squares fit. He'd say, here's a model. There's an error term. We're going to assume that the X's are, are, uh, have zero covariance with the error term. Solve that moment problem. You get the OLS coefficients. If you're going mm. to teach instrument variables, right? There's an error term. You think of its properties. What is it uncorrelated with? Those are your instruments. That's a moment condition, solve that. Mm. If you think about MLE, the, you might think of the first order conditions of MLE as a set of moment conditions. Right, 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 right. And then you would build, uh, you would build your knowledge of you know, the variance of the estimate and stuff up from that. Mm. Um, does does so Mansky kind of have a big shadow on your ensuing work? I don't know. Yes. He does. How come? Well, I'm not sure he knew that either, really. I think he thought of it as being different of many, yeah. much of our career. But, but yes, the big shadow. Uh, also, he taught us simulation estimators, um, maximum likelihood, discrete choice, McFadden style models. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, all of that had a big influence. But also, I think just this point of view that you think about an economic restriction, you derive an estimator from that. Uh -huh. Think about the economic yeah 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 um, of course he's done that throughout his career in different different ways sort of um yeah anyway so he had a big influence well who's think, he, go ahead yeah go ahead so at some point there was one year when i was at wisconsin one year when they had um uh, obviously uh goldberger and mansky but also um gary chamberlain oh really uh, ariel pecus 
<laughs> um, Jim Powell was technically there for a year, I think maybe. Wow. Uh, maybe he was visiting. Uh, it was just an extraordinary econometric. Did process. you know at the time this was kind of weird that you had all these people? It seemed, it seemed unbelievable. And it was unstable. People flew off to all kinds of places. Uh, mm. Yes, it seemed, it seemed amazing. Uh, mm. But there was a lot of stuff going on. Mm. Uh, it was just super inspiring. Yeah. Well, who what, so then, who taught you I.O. then? Right. So um, I.O. was very weird right then. It had been an empirical field, not very connected to theory, and, oh. and game theory was coming in. Oh, right. So the, the, the I.O. is becoming a game theory field. So I.O. was game theory. Uh, labor was applied econometrics. And at Wisconsin, it was a fair number of models. Uh, Chris Flynn was there. Other people were there. Um, Chris Flynn was a Heckman student. Mm. So um, labor was very empirical, somewhat model-based. Um, um, I always a pure theory field. Mm. Uh, coming out of it, there was an older empirical guy who was kind of, you know, his, 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 the, the, his approach was going out. Uh, and there were some young game players. So I learned game theory and I learned some techniques from the more structural labor people. Mm. John Rust was there teaching dynamic models. Oh my gosh. Wow. I don't so, know the full history of Wisconsin, apparently. I yeah, I mean, I mean, this didn't last. I mean, I mean, five years after I graduated, uh Goldberger was still there. Right? <laughs> wow. So you studied uh, with Rust? You studied with John I Rust? I sat in on John's class. I mean, he was just a few years. I'm not even sure John's much older than me. I think he's maybe two years older than I am. But oh. but uh, anyway, he was a whiz at MIT, and I sat in on his class toward the end. Wow. And then R.L. Pickus joined briefly. Hmm. How much, how old are, how, what's the age gap between you and Dr. Pickus? It's, uh, nine years, I think, probably nine, ten years. Ten years. Ten years. Okay. Probably. Yeah. So, so what was your, so what is your job market paper what would you end up doing uh, my that? job market paper was on entry in the airline industry um, oh um actually won the first medal um uh won what won the first medal of the econometric society oh uh, okay but but oil changed it a lot because i had a set of ideas i was going to go on the market had a set of ideas and he came and said you know you've made all these functional form restrictions and you could really free them up if you use these simulation estimators that I'm working on. Mm. So I stayed another year. Uh, and did, did, free it, did free it up? Yep, freed it up. Uh, <laughs> got me a job at Yale. Uh, I don't think I would have gotten. Yeah. Uh, coming out of Wisconsin. So yeah, it worked. Yeah. Wow. Wow. What's that project about? Actually, now everything's running together for me. What, what, what was yeah, that? So that was, a, that, I mean, looking back at it, that's a really good question what that paper was about. You know, because a little bit it was about, can you take a game theory model and estimate it? Which isn't a great right. question for someone who has, you know, got the economics to solve a problem. Um, but there was a big debate then about the role under uh, deregulation of these airline hubs that were forming and were they frustrating competition? So yeah. it was about the formation of these hub networks. Yeah, yeah. Why? Well, so just for the sake of the the listener yeah. who, who hears, you know, there's an it's a question as to whether or not you could estimate something in a game theory model. Can yeah. you tell me what what you mean by that? Why is that a problem? Yeah. So so here's the you, you know I I I teach the freshman micro and when we get to oligopoly and we talk about the theory of games, we say that you know the problem there is that in a game theory, which is a meta a game theoretical model is a metaphor for some strategic situation in the world. It's a, it's a, it's a model that's a metaphor for that. Mm. Uh, what I do depends on what you do. So I need to think about what you're going to do. But I know that you're thinking about what I'm going to do. Right? And right. Then I think about what you think I'm going to think about what I'm going to do. So all the decisions are interrelated. Yeah. So there's this really deep kind of simultaneity. Where, yeah, right. You know, right. the model is defined like by a fixed point of reactions into reactions, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So, sort of, your first thought is everything is is endogenous. A right. lot of things are endogenous, and the other thing is, I just looked at the standard. A number of us did at the time. Um, Tim Bresnahan was already doing it. You look at the set of tools on the shelf that I'd learned from the labor economists. It's like, is this a probit? Is it um, is it a hazard model? Mm -hmm. It's like, what is it? Right. Uh, and these models didn't seem to map into any of those just kind of off the shelf tools. Right. Uh, so the question is, uh, 
how could you think about data generated from a strategic situation uh, where there's an equilibrium in in play, and 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 how would you think about estimating that? Right, 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 right. Puzzle. Uh, there's not a precedent. There's not like you couldn't even do what Goldberger was doing in the simultaneous equations and kind of like riff on it a little bit. Well, I mean, it obviously influenced me uh, for sure, but you know, uh, many of the hard problems were well, entries discrete, mm. right? So that doesn't sound very linear. Um, right. Uh, so part of it was there were natural nonlinearities, um, but yeah, in the end, it turns out to be a system of simultaneous equations. So, so there, there was something to that, mm. uh, and you have to think about what's shifting them and and how you you know how you would model them. Yeah. Uh, I. I think this general issue sent for better and worse IO through my young decades in the profession on kind of a methodological quest, which was mm. how were we going to deal with these issues? Mm. The issues, the issues of endogeneity, the identification. Endogeneity of, of the form that show up in, in game theoretic context. In yeah. the, right, these, uh, yeah, right. That's, that's real simultaneity, not not just correlation with an unobservable, but but variables within the system are causing other variables within the system. And there are uh, multiple variables. So it's not like it, the one and not the thing. What did it feel like? I mean, when you won this, you get this incredibly prestigious award, this fish medal. What was that like? It was great. It was particularly good since the first time I came up for tenure, I didn't get it. And then I almost immediately won the fish medal. So that felt good. Yeah, they were <laughs> like, we made a mistake. <laughs> uh, my colleagues i think were always behind me there might have been a university committee somewhere right. but um uh um uh so that felt good that's awesome uh, uh and um by then i was i was also working on i was also working on blp by that point okay all right i want to talk about i can't wait to talk about this so um so what year are we at so before we get into the blp yeah um can you sort of just sort of set it up a little bit for the sake of those who are listening and don't have any background in econ or just the, yep. the context being supply and demand? Supply so and demand, right. this is exactly you can tell right. me a little bit about why, about what is going on and why that's going to create any issues for what, well, what is it you want to know when people are economists want to know stuff. And then, you know, just tell me any, anything you want to tell me about that before we talk about. Yeah. This. So, so, for anyone who's had any economics at all, like like just you, if you dropped out of econ after after six weeks, the first thing you see is is a supply and demand model. So mm -hmm. uh, there's demand coming from consumers, there's supply coming from firms, there's an equilibrium where the two curves cross, mm -hmm. and we tell the undergraduates it's this tremendously powerful model where you can do all kinds of policy analyses. Mm -hmm. to, what a carbon tax on gasoline, all that will shift the supply curve. It'll move against the demand curve. How much will price go up depends on the shape of the supply and demand curves as well as the uh, the amount of the tax. Right. The other really cool thing about supply and demand is that in some cases, you can predict the effect of policies that you have never seen. So it's not just ex post policy evaluation, it's ex ante. So again, take that model we give to the undergraduates in week three or four or something. Uh, you put a tax on a good, there's never been a tax on that good. Right. Structure of supply and demand will tell you the the what the buyers will pay, what the sellers will pay, and how much will be traded. What's the social welfare consequence of that? I'll tell you all that. Mm. Right. So it's this amazing tool, mm. uh, but it has this feature of simultaneity that 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 you can't say that prices are causing quantity or that quantities are causing prices. That's true within one curve, like within demand or within supply, there's a relationship between quantities and prices, but it's an equilibrium relationship between quantities and prices. And really it's the system that throws out the price and the quantity. Mm. System of equations that creates the outcomes. Mm. Um, and that's different than cases where you start with the question, what is the effect of X on Y? That's different was, from like a kind of Rubeny type of Yeah, question. because, right. So think about it. It's not there in that model. There is no a single effect of price on quantity. It's not really well-defined. Mm. There's an effect in consumers desire to consume. And there's a different effect in suppliers willingness to supply. Right. So you look at the cloud of points of quantities and prices and things that you would see in the data. Um, it's not true that price causes quantity or quantity causes price. 
Mm. The, ex the factors that shift supply and demand cause price and quantity. Right, 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 right. Through the system, they pass through the system and they come yeah. out. Right. But we're interested in the components of the system, not just in the pass-through of a demand shifter to price or quantity, because it's the it's the separate components of supply and demand that allow us to do this ex post policy evaluation. Mm -hmm. So this becomes this tool for the questions I studied as an undergraduate, right? To uh, you know, what's the effect of the carbon tax? How do you solve global warming? Those are to an economist, those are kind of supply and demand questions, and and, mm -hmm. and to me, that's what makes I O distinct. Mm. some of the other applied micro fields it's this focus on the equilibrium outcome uh and you know if it's interesting probably of uh, something interesting like a policy change right 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 um where things are being determined simultaneously not yeah. not a simple x causes y right now, way, you can write a demand curve using ruben though that you mentioned like the, yeah. the, the statistical framework you can write a demand curve using that notation obviously right Right. But it's a kind of different thing in 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 that you're not going to get a policy question answered by just knowing the effect of uh, a demand shifter on price or something like that. Can can you sort of contract like so? Could you sort of do like a straw man kind of conversation where you would where somebody is saying, uh, well, um, I think of it as a, um, you know, price causes quantity and, and, and sort of help me understand a little bit better about what's lit, what's, what's missing in that kind of reasoning that you said. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So sometimes, yeah, I've, I've actually jokingly thought about this, that someone could come who is trained in a different tradition and say that uh, I'm going to find the effect of price on quantity. Right. Right. And maybe they come up with something they think uh, causes price and uh, somehow isn't present in that relationship, is excluded. So it's an instrument. Mm -hmm. One person might do it and find a positive relationship. Mm -hmm. Another person might do it, find a negative relationship. Right. Well, how can that be? Well, if you understand supply and demand, you understand, well, there are positive and negative forces at work. Right? Oh, yep, yep. You have to disentangle them. Right, right. You're talking about in an equilibrium system, increases yep. in price have effects on equilibrium outcomes because of supply and demand. Because of supply and demand. Yeah, because right? they have they affect out people differently. Demand separately. Right. Right. You may say, gee, on average, prices and quantities barely seem to affect each other. Right. You know, right. one goes up, one goes down. Sometimes they both go up together. Right. But if you mm -hmm. thought, if for an undergraduate, right, says, oh, look, there was an economic boom. Demand went up. The price of oil went up. Mm. Another time, oh look, the Saudis uh, held back on oil. Yeah, the went up, demand went down. Right, right. Because one time the demand shifted, the other time the supply shifted. Right, right, right. And if you don't separate those two effects, a you can't even understand what's going on. Right. Uh, but b you can't do this kind of policy evaluation. So that paper. So so when you said you had been working on it for a while, so so tell me. What's the what's the very beginning germ of an idea where you you're starting to think about so I, the I, inadequacy of what's available at the moment? Right. So I think the three McFadden's of, estimating demand with the on the Bart subway yes. or Bart line a long time right. ago. Long time ago, right? So I had been thinking about that paper, in fact, and that work pretty hard. And what was confusing to me is there seemed to be no problem of price endogeneity. Mm. It never came up. And I was like, why is that? How can that be? It seems like it's demand, but how are the prices determined? And what I had realized is that there is no demand unobservable in the McFadden model. Mm. There's nothing like a demand shock at the level of the market. And Nobody had said that before. That wasn't like a widely. I don't know of someone saying. I do not know of someone saying that before. I do mm. not. Um, and someone might have mentioned it by now. Although you never know, because often a lot. Yeah, of exactly. Come up later. People have, <laughs> so people, have vivid people have vivid memories when everybody knows something. I, exactly. Suddenly they find. <laughs> the, the, Suddenly the, they're like, "I thought of that." <laughs> and okay, McFadden was also very smart. So he had something in his. Um, discrete choice models, which were a choice specific constant. 
And um, that was being held fixed. So later on, I came to think, okay, the unobservables are in that constant somewhere. Mm. Um, and so I, but if you were to move across markets, um, maybe that constant would shift. Maybe it would shift according to some things we see, mm. some market level things, and maybe some market level things that we didn't see. Right. And then voila, you have a demand error. And mm. then if prices shift in the second market, you worry that prices are correlated with that shift. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, it doesn't take that much of a change to get the demand error in there, but particularly when you ran across markets. Mm. So I've been thinking about that. And mm. actually I have a paper in Rand 1994 that's way easier to read than than, than the later work if someone mm. wants to read it. Mm. Uh, it's probably a much easier place to start on this kind of uh, um, question. Mm. And a useful thing, by the way, should have said, wh why would you think about the, the, the discrete choice literature at all? Is it lets you think about differentiated products? So, so the the right. the I just mentioned the undergraduate model where there is a demand curve, but you look out in the world, uh, and you know McFadden looked out at transportation. And it's like, well, the bus is different than than walking is different than you know a subway, right? Is different than the car, um, like consumer goods and automobiles and everything, and um, many, many, many things are highly differentiated in geography and, and product characteristics and quality, perception and marketing. Uh, um, uh, so for all the reasons we wanted to do supply and demand before, I wanted to do supply and demand in a differentiated product setting. Mm -hmm. And to a large degree, McFadden had, but without this price endogeneity issue. So I had been thinking about that. Mm. Jim Levinson came and gave a seminar at Yale what, how, old, how old are you at this point, Steve? So it's probably 91, 92. So I'm like 32, I guess. Ah, so you got tenure, right? Well, was I tenured yet? No, not, not quite, almost. Um, mm. um, and um, But you're thinking about, is it that you're thinking about that McFadden? Yep, I'm um, thinking about the McFadden that's stuff. That's kind of the and, germ and, of it. And, you're not yeah. thinking about automobiles. No, I'm not thinking about automobiles in particular. I've been thinking about airlines. Airlines, uh, but 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 not automobiles. Uh -huh. So, um, um, and I had been thinking about maybe an airline model. Mm. Um, Jim Levinson came, gave a really nice paper he had written with Rob Deenstra, a trade paper. Mm. There were lots of trade questions about automobiles at that time. The, the Japanese were going to take over the world. All the cars right. were Japanese. There was trade policy to keep the Japanese from taking over the domestic market. How should we think about all of that? Yeah. Well, okay. Different. Okay. Supply and demand, but differentiated products and it's imperfect competition. Mm -hmm. So demand is different. Supply is different. Mm -hmm. Imperfect competition, which is like a game theory problem and yeah. it's differentiated products. Right. And they modeled cars as being in a product space, size, fuel efficiency, you know, number of doors, things like that. Mm. And they presented a paper that was very, very interesting and um, also probably had some issues. So um, the three of us talked, Jim and Arlo and I afterward. And um, had you and Dr. Parkes Ar kept up from grad okay, school? Okay, so, okay, yes. And why in particular? Because uh, the year, uh, several uh, months or so after I accepted my junior offer at Yale, he accepted a senior offer. Oh, he was there. We were calling. Oh, we're, we're teaching college. us together in Yale. Oh, right, I exactly. See. We're we're together. Yeah. Uh, is he teaching an IO class? Is that what he was doing, or was he teaching an yeah. econometrics yeah. class? No, he. I think prior to coming to Yale, he had been thought of as an applied econometrician, someone who studied productivity. So he grew a student, oh. and Chamberlain. Student. Um, when he came to Yale, he started teaching um, um, IO with me. Oh, um, cool. I don't know if he ever had an IO class, but we started teaching it together. Huh. Um, and again, Yale was very strong at econometrics. We had Peter Phillips and Don Andrews and um, good young people. And it was, um, um, people like us were not econometricians at Yale. Right. Okay. Which I was fine with because I was interested in the world. I wanted to model the world anyway. So that was, yeah, 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 right. right. You're, I, you're Isaac Asimov. You're you're thinking about the world. Yeah, I'm still, yeah, right. Exactly. I still want to model the world. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay, so so you're 32 years old. You're thinking about this model. Yeah. You have this con. They have they present this paper, 
And y'all right, so Jim up. comes, presents this paper, and it has all these cool features, but it's not clear how it's all worked out. Mm. So Jim and I, sorry, Arl and I talked to Jim, and we assure him that between us, we have the, all the tools to, to solve this problem. Hmm. I've been working on simulation estimators, which makes more complicated discrete choice models possible. Hmm. Uh, all three of us have been thinking a little bit about the imperfect competition side in pricing. Hmm. Been thinking about that. Uh, I've been thinking about the simultaneity problem in, in this kind of model. And it was going to be really easy to just string all these things together into a framework that would let us get back to the trade policy question. Right. Uh, it wasn't quite as easy as we thought. Um, Did it feel uh, super ambitious when y'all are talking to him? The, the three y'all are talking, you're like, this is going to be... a little naive. It's like, of course we can just put these things together. It wasn't <laughs> that easy. Um, 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 it wasn't easy at all. We had... Uh, I was working on a you know desktop computer that was a uh, Intel 386 chip with the extra compute... <laughs> or something <laughs> Wait, what year is it it's 91 92 92 93 yeah, yeah. Exactly. You, right. you had the 386 is that what you said yeah, 386, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. exactly I so really the like do this on a computer like that yeah uh we hadn't done it before there were numerical issues with the simulation um um uh could we get it to work we had to work out the supply side we worked out an inversion argument on the supply side that helped us uh um I think it's true that at one point, Jim Levinson, when something new was proposed, started asking when the next solution was supposedly easy, he would say, do you mean easy or do you mean Pecos easy? <laughs> yeah, right. It's really hard. It's, hard. it's like super hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty hard. Uh, I got a year's leave at the Bureau. I got an Olin Fellowship uh, where I could just go in and just, just sit at the computer all day long. What were you doing on the computer? Tell me, like, what are you doing? You're coding? Coding, yeah. Trying to get this thing to work. Trying to figure out how it works. You already had the econometrics worked out? Or what's going on? Much of it, but uh, no, we would run into other problems. Um, um, We would have an idea and run into a problem and try to come up with a better idea and and sort of iterate on that. Um, Mm. Going back and forth between thinking about the problem, solutions, and then seeing if we could code them. Was there a natural division of labor during that time that you guys were kind of? Jim and I were coding. Aro was not coding. Uh, mm-hmm. He was a senior guy. Yeah. Uh, uh, Aro was often more a little more sophisticated on the econometrics, was helping mm-hmm. solve econometrics problems. Um, um, Jim was coding, thinking about all those things. Also, he he knew the trade issues and the automobile data better. Oh, I see. Um, what, what data? Where'd you get the data? Well, how much, how big was the data set? It was not very big, really, because we didn't have, inf- and uh, I thought about this a lot recently, but but um, it was pure product level data. It, it, we, all we had were the characteristics and prices of cars and their sales. It's um, like that. It's like that uh, that automobile data and Stata. Yeah. It, no, no, it's very similar. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's all right. It's a lot like that. Right. It was very similar <laughs> to that. Yeah. yeah like, just like wow. the outer data set. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, and we had it for like 20 years. So <laughs> Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, looking back, it may not have been enough data, <clears throat> but, um, um, you know, it's what we had and it's what we were going to do. Well, what, uh, so you would do something, it wouldn't work. What, what, what did you guys know it would look like if it did work? You know, your, your cut, what, what would you have said? Hey, I think we, we got wanted it. the supply and demand system. We wanted not, we wanted all the elasticities of, if you change the price of one car, what happens to the sales of similar, not just to it, but similar cars. So like, how do you know that you don't have it though? How do you, oh, okay. well, at one point it's just things aren't working or, 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 or things are horribly non-robust or something like that. Right. You know, in the end, we got an answer um, 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 that, that didn't seem crazy. I think at one point Tim Brezhnev teased us and said, well, you know, uh, these guys tried several things and then they tried some more and then they stopped when the uh, things looked good to them. <laughs> yeah. okay, yeah, I have a life. Yeah. When, when we couldn't reject it as being insane, we were like, wow, that's not bad, huh? <laughs> oh. uh, there was some point, there was some tr- little truth to that, I think, a yeah. little bit. But, but you know, um, uh, we wanted something that had enough detail that we felt like we could do a policy analysis that wasn't crazy, results that were uh, plausible. Yeah. Um, um, uh and no one had really done it before so we were just trying to show you could do it too yeah yeah well so what happened so you publish you you get this paper you write it up it's paper it's it's hard to write 
Um, I don't mm. think we know how to write it up very well. People say it's hard to read. I believe them. Um, <laughs> uh, and I believe them. Uh, hey, 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 you're uh, lying. But I will say, sitting at the bureau, I was like, you know, there's just an elegance to the way this stuff, people may not see it right away, but there's an elegance to the way this stuff fits together. The yeah. different parts really together. And I, this could be a hit. It's like, I mm. felt like this could be, this could be a nice paper. This could mm. be a nice people pay attention to just because it just, it just, the mom just felt like they were just parts. And I've had some other friends that teased me. They said, you know, nothing in that paper is new. Situation estimators were known. Discrete choice models are known. Simultaneity is known. Oligopoly pricing rules are known. I'm like, fine. We just put it together. I'm fine with that. We just assemble the thing. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I have no trouble with that characterization. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, that yeah. seems a little. That seems a little condescending, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe it's, they it were makes it sound like it was easy. It's pockets yeah. easy. That, yeah. that paper. That paper was was Doctor Pockets easy. Yeah. It, it was. It was Baker's easy, right? <laughs> Baker's exactly. easy. That was only Baker's easy, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, uh, and it came out, and people were really interested. But again, we were in an era where the fact that we had you know, the sort of game theoretic oligopoly pricing, you know, impressed people all by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, paper got reference, ridiculous references in the early years. Like both, several of my early papers did like, game theory is an interesting topic and the models might even be estimated. See, might. It's like a little cheap, but I'll take it. <laughs> sure, yeah, that's right. That'll, that'll, that's right, yeah. Uh, okay. Now what, what, I would say one thing. That, one thing that I think people don't realize enough is we then turned to the trade policy question, and we wrote a paper published in the AER in 1999. Mm. And in some sense, that 1999 paper is the paper we intended to write. Mm. It had the trade policy in it. It also had better instruments and, and some other improvements. Mm. Uh, I think our instruments in the first paper were real sketchy, uh, and I think we did a much better job in the 99 paper actually. Well, so well, when did you get the, so it gets public, how, when did you first notice that it was a hit? I mean, it gets, you know, it gets a top five, but you've got a bunch of those. So how did you start to feel like, when did you notice it was becoming influential? Yeah, at first, um, you know, it was, it was a popular paper to give. So that's a good sign, right? There's just like seminar circuit demand for it, right? And right. then um, a few years later, um, Yves Naveau, who was, who was a student at Harvard, wrote a paper on breakfast cereal and mergers uh, and got uh, got a great job out of it. And a couple of our students said, wait, you didn't tell me we could just run BLP and get a great job. And get a great job. <laughs> <laughs> like, just run BLP. But, but, but they were like, wait, is that like something you can do? Right. Uh, so other people started picking it up and using it for different policy questions. I think, yeah. I think the point is it was a tool. Yeah. Uh, it's a little frightening, by the way, when you create a tool or crank, because people will crank it and they'll crank it. Right. Idea and they'll crank it. <laughs> it's a little not such a great idea. Yeah. Can you do it uh, in Stata? That'll probably crank it even more if you can. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think someone did try in Stata. I'm not sure. But yeah, I may I ask Chat GPT. I'll ask Chat GPT to write the Stata code. For there you go. The other thing is, you know, we insisted on this whole random coefficients thing in the simulation, which makes the demand much harder. If yeah. you do something like vested logit, there are closed forums and you can run it in state of easy. Mm -hmm. What were you writing it in? MATLAB or what's what okay. would you use back then? Uh, uh, yeah. So um, there was a language called Gauss. Oh, yeah. Which, yeah. Which was basically based on early versions of MATLAB, but MATLAB hadn't been commercialized much at that point. Mm. So Gauss was a matrix programming language, very much like MATLAB. Mm. And you were that, so that was your bread and butter. That's what economists use. That's that's what John. Oh, they were using Gauss. Okay, that's, they wrote John Rust wrote the Harold Zerger paper in Gauss, and that was the most common probably language because yeah. it had the advantage of MATLAB and being a matrix programming language, which is you know good when it comes time to invert yeah. variance matrices and things. And um, uh, it it was it was more commercially developed at that time. But, yeah. and then later on, MATLAB beat them. Right. Well, so let me ask you this. Um, since that's like the paper that you're probably going to win another award for one day. Uh, what's your second favorite paper that you've ever written? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that's, yeah, yeah, it's hard to choose among your children. I okay. Know. But, okay, okay. Okay, we're talking about a lot, lots of successes. Let, let me tell you about a, a paper that that was kind of a publishing failure that I really, really like. Okay. So I had wanted to do this on airlines. 
And I had a colleague, Pablo Spiller, uh, who was at um, Illinois, he's at Berkeley now. He had a somewhat older student who was a very good programmer. And we did a version of this for airlines and we didn't do uh, random coefficients. We did a mixed logit where hoping to find that there was a type of consumer who looked like a tourist traveler, mm. and a type of airline consumer who looked like a business traveler. Mm. And on the supply side, we didn't just do the, uh, we didn't just do the um, 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 imperfect competition, but we modeled uh, net, uh, airline hubs as, as, as shifting costs and demand both. Mm. And to run it, um, this young, well, not young, sorry, graduate student who was not young, uh, ran it on the giant um, University of Illinois supercomputers. They had this great supercomputer center there. Mm. And I really liked that paper. And it, uh, it, uh, uh, the graduate student left and we lost, and Pablo left Illinois and we lost access to the supercomputers. Oh. And it was on a third round revision at the AER and it never got sent back. Oh, cause it, cause you couldn't get. Yeah. And I just, I got caught up in some other things. And at some point I'm like, wait, we never did it. And you need to call somebody up at the Illinois right now and get it. <laughs> ask, well, ask and it got published in a, you know, I had tenure and it got dumped in a volume somewhere. And, yeah. uh, but I actually think that Send was. Send it uh, back to Orly Ashenfelter. Say I finally. Exactly. Got I finally the got the revision for you, Orly. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what the editor was. And uh, uh, so, uh, um, uh, anyway, uh, I, I, that's a paper that like, you know, so not everything, not every, not everything always fall, not everything fall, yeah. all the pegs fall in the holes all the time. Right. Right. Yeah, uh, totally. uh, 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 but I like that paper a lot. I also like my work, which is much methodologically simpler with uh, Joel Waldfogel. Uh, that think. was my next question. I want uh, to talk about that. Really like there, papers, yeah. yeah. That seems could that, that that you're talking about. It's mostly radios, right? Radio. Those, radio those stations. Radio papers. Yes. Yeah. Will you talk about that? I was really curious about that. Radio seems so antiquated but it was like the 90s so i'm just curious what yeah. were you guys working on yeah so the idea is that you know so there's there's pricing aspects of oligopoly but there are also product variety and entry aspects of oligopoly and it's it's interesting because an oligopoly there's a oligopolists have slightly weird incentives mm -hmm. so you want to enter to provide a new good that people might like but one of the things you can do is enter and offer a pretty similar good and you'll, some people probably buy it anyway. And you'll basically just take business from an existing rival. Mm -hmm. As long as markups are positive, you make money, maybe yeah. you cover the fixed cost. You know, so there are serious issues about this in generic drugs and different, you know, or, or new drugs that are just me too drugs that are just like other drugs. Um, but there was an old literature claiming this was a big deal in radio. Mm. That, you know, if you, there are old p papers from the 50s complaining that, Oh my God, there are seven stations playing rock and roll, right? Even though there's a, some market for classical music. It's, it's, it's better to split the rock and roll market than it is to you know, serve the small classical market, even though you might think from a social welfare perspective, you'd like to have more variety. Right, right. Uh, so this is an aspect of oligopoly and imperfect competition. And yeah. radio was this classic point. We did think, okay, is radio, you know, even then, you thought, is radio a big deal? It turned out that people spent about 15, at that time, people spent maybe 15% of their day listening to the radio in the car or work uh, while they were making dinner. Mm. Uh, so it wasn't a huge- 15 amount. minutes? 15? Sorry, 15% of their waking 15 hour. 15%? Oh. Because people listen on their commute. Yeah. I just think about, why, why do you listen to Spotify now? People listen to the radio then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. All the time right. you have your earphones in while you're working or driving. Yeah, or, you can't you know, call in. You can't call in on Spotify and yeah, ask I know, to play exactly. Your song. Exactly. <laughs> right. There's no there's no shock jock in the morning to wake you up. That's right. Uh, yeah. Uh so anyway, so that was a paper about that, about business stealing. And yeah. there had been a classic theory paper by uh, by Mike Winston and, and Greg Menke on this idea that, that an oligopoly entrant might be motivated by taking business away from rivals more than more than just by providing a service or driving the price down. Oh, that's interesting. And we learned that. Like, how, it just, is that just a big deal? Is the business dealing thing just like a big deal? Um, and it's a pretty simple uh, setup. Again, it's an equilibrium where there's yeah. a number of you know, radio stations and uh, to what degree do they provide extra variety and to what degree are they just very similar and stealing listeners from other stations. Mm. And uh, the source of exogenous variation was that cities of different size 
uh, can support a different number of radio stations because there's a fixed cost of entry. Right. So cities have a ton of stations. Small cities have many fewer stations. And the basic idea was you're adding many more stations as you move from you know Dubuque to, to, to New York. How much more listening do you get? Right. Like, do people oh. a variety and listen a lot more? Or is it right. just like you've got kind of a fixed number of listeners and we're just divvying this market up? So it's yeah, kind of it's just like, like if it is rate. distributing across the yeah. preferences of the consumer, then it is sort of, yeah. it is optimal. You think you'd but feel, they're doing you one of these. Like, more listening, like more yeah, people yeah, yeah. listen more because they're getting their preferences. And but if you're doing out. one of these hoteling models, then it's yes. just like we're all listening to the exactly, same exactly the exact same music, thing. right? Oh. We all plus so that was the measurement idea that we're going to use this kind of natural experiment of 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 population size to trace out kind of the listening share and and then put that back to a model where you could interpret that in this variety way you just interpreted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what do you find? That up. Um, um, there is a variety effect of the new stations, but there's a ton of business dealing. Ah. Um, uh, um, so, um, if you looked just at the, well, and by the way, there were, there was a little, the revenue in the industry is coming from advertisers. So there was an advertiser demand function in there too. Mm. Um, and it is true that new entry drove down the price of ads a little bit. Um, so there was some benefit to advertisers there. It turned out that if you looked from just the viewpoint of the true market participants, who are the radio stations and the advertisers, there were way too many radio stations. Mm -hmm. You could just cut a ton of radio stations back, save a lot of fixed costs. Price would go up a little bit, but you'd save so much money, it would improve social welfare. Now, aha, on the other hand, radio is interesting because it turns out that all of us listening in those days were not the market participants. We were unpriced inputs into the sale of ads of ads yeah oh, we were just like like the internet right if it's free you're the product uh, right right uh so if you okay so there might have been a coincidence there that there were way too many stations relative to the market participants ah on the other hand there was this externality to all of us unpriced inputs mm. uh, and plausibly those might have balanced out not too bad so mm. this probably not a social disaster but mm -hmm. because of but but not because of some fundamental market force, but just mm. because by happenstance, uh, th there was a there was an unpriced externality that we were. Mm -hmm. Well, so what do you think now that you studied studied so much music? I mean, what do you you've watched it go from radio uh, into into streaming yeah. platforms? I mean, what do you what what's new and what's just the same old stuff? And what do you think the big questions are? Yeah, so Joel kept on this more than I did, actually. So I followed his work, and he's been really interested in these questions, like how much value do you put on the tail of the of the little songs and the little bands that you never would have heard on the radio, right? Right. That, you know, the top station was only going to play this limited amount of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's actually done uh, fun stuff trying to look at, you know, how much do people value that tail? Uh, I think he finds it's pretty good for people, right? That that mm -hmm. that you know this new world where you can where you can um where you can uh, find music is very valuable to listeners. Actually, mm -hmm. that you know, in the aggregate that creates a lot of value. Right. Uh, I think the other interesting thing in music, though, is when I was a kid, you uh, you toured to support your album sales. Yeah. Now you put out music to support your concert prices. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. That's where the money is. So that sort of changed. They figured out and, price discrimination and uh right. So rather than have a packed concert and then all the kids went out and bought your album, you made money. Yeah. Uh now Spotify is not paying you much for those listens. Yeah. Uh and that creates fans. And then you have a concert at a tremendously high Yeah. Price, right? uh, man, my daughters were uh saying, Hey, can we have can we have some money to go to Taylor Swift? I was like, sure. And then they I was like, look, I was like. Is there an Wait. extra zero on this? What is, what's going on? Exactly. There's something wrong here. Way, as a kid, yeah. this doesn't seem, it's like the worst seat was re, not, I was like, no, you can't. You can go no, watch yeah, yeah, no, a actually, documentary literally, on Netflix. Literally, we can't pay for that. No. <laughs> you exactly. get a job. Go, go get a job. You can go work yeah. for a summer and go get one ticket. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's fun stuff. But the, the fun thing is now in IO, I think we're in a different space. We spent a long time on methods. Mm. Um, um, I would tease my macro colleagues that, you know, they only had two parameters and no price endogeneity. And they would say, yeah, but you write papers on yogurt. Uh, well, okay. Touche. I, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I think now we're seeing, and particularly among, uh, a younger generation of people who are really taking the tools that we developed 
and really digging into just tons of interesting questions and yeah. equilibrium questions and healthcare and urban economics and um, um, uh, education and mm. environmental questions. Yeah. Uh, and there are all these kind of supply and demand questions. Uh, um, right. You know, what does the deregulated market for uh, elementary schools look like in Chile? Right. Where you get entry, just like I said, and you get business dealing, just like I said. Yeah. And you get pricing power uh, and, and the products are differentiated and all the stuff we did for auto shows up, but it's education for poor kids in Chile. Yeah. You know, it's uh, funny. That's it, really cool. It's funny, like um, your work just kind of reminds me of how a stat, and this isn't a, saying anything about a statistician. I'm just saying a statistician wouldn't have found what you're doing because it really had to come from thinking about supply and demand and models and uh, behavioral yep. models and not yep. really, it's not really statistics that's driving it. You know, it's, no. it's, it's uh, an under it's this understanding of the world uh, of like, it's the old, it's theory, it's theory, not like statistical yep. theory. It's like behavioral right. market theory. Yep. They would yep. not, have, they would not right. find it. Right. I think that's right. You need that. You need those models to help guide the work. Now, of course, then, as I said earlier on, once it gets a little bit complicated, then you need some statistics to figure out. Yeah, like, exactly. You know, okay, right. Right. I mean, is this identified? Is this, you know, what do I do with the standard, you know, with the standard error estimate of my parameter right. or whatever? And you right. need a lot of statistics. In the totally. End, but, you but, need but, all this. Right. But the reason that I don't think I'm an econometrician is I'm a pure, I feel like I'm a pure user of that theory. I'm right. grateful for it. Um, same way I'm not a game theorist, right? I'm a mm -hmm. user, right? I, I I I I pull that stuff out from from other people um, as needed, yeah. Uh, and I'm super grateful that it's there, right? Because uh, then you can just put all the stuff together, right? Well, th this is the last question because uh, it's top yeah. of the hour. So you know, yeah. uh, when you think about where the field of IO is now and where you just sort of see it going what what excites you the most about you know where you see this this going right now I think it's this expansion out into more and more policy relevant areas by the way which is why I'm interested in this Tobin Center stuff people say oh yeah let's talk about that right people say they're surprised I do that but yeah. I my answer is I spent all this time building tools if they can't help us figure out the world I'm in trouble Right, right. So wait, what is this Tobin Center? <laughs> it's time center? to use them. It's time what to is, use them. Is the Tobin Center is a brand new policy center? It's Yale a brand new policy, policy center, center at Yale. Uh, just set up where we've been around for about three years. We've been able to hire some great staff. We're really trying to be sincere about taking economics, you know, often database, sometimes model-based, sometimes not, mm -hmm. uh, out into the policy world. And, and uh I have a colleague who said it's so sad. My my young colleague writes a great paper. It has great policy implications. It goes in a great journal. And as far as the rest of the world is concerned, it, it, it might as well be dumped in a lake. Right. That right. affects everything. So how can we take really good quality research and in a sincere way, figure out how to get it out in a way that would actually help people? So you're working on, you have faculty that are there and it's not a public policy school. It's not it's like not you a get school. a PhD. It's not a school where basically, it's basically involves the, the, the research agendas of economists across Yale and the econ mm. department and the school of the environment, the business school and the law school and the school of public health, right? And mm -hmm. uh, it has to come up from the faculty because someone's got to do the research. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and then the question is, how do you help support that through infrastructure, data infrastructure, um, help people get data on campus, help them secure their data, help them do the research. Mm -hmm. Then when it's interesting and solid and, you know, more than one person agrees, it's good. Yeah. Uh, uh, take it out to the world. Yeah. Uh, and so that's that's a new adventure. That's a new adventure for me. A very new adventure for me. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Oh, yeah. well, good luck with that. That sounds thank fantastic. You. That sounds fantastic. Well, um, uh, thanks for being on the show. And this was so much fun. Um, great. Uh, you know, I think it, you're real. It's you're really inspiring for those of us that uh, also were bookworms and weren't good in math. And so, uh, <laughs> exactly. Come on. Right. <laughs> if Steve, can, if Steve can do it. The, yeah. the, the the biggest bookworm ever then uh yeah. the rest of us have hope <laughs> exactly <laughs> well it's real really an honor um 
and uh, uh, um, I hope we get to run into each other in real life then soon. Yes, thanks a lot. It's okay. it it a nice blend. I really appreciate your blend. It's fantastic. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Gotta see us soon.